Book One, The Church of the Conquerors, Part Three, of The Prophets of Religion by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Holy Inquisition. Let us have one glimpse of the conditions in those medieval times, so that we may know what we ourselves have escaped. In the fifteenth century there was established in Europe the cult of a three-headed god, whose priests had won lordship over a continent. They were enormously wealthy, and unthinkably corrupt. They sold to the rich the license to commit every possible crime, and they held the poor in ignorance and degradation. Among the comparatively intelligent and freedom-loving people of Bohemia there arose a great reformer, John Huss, himself a priest, protesting against the corruptions of his order. They trapped him into their power by means of a safe conduct, which they repudiated because no promise to a heretic could have validity. They found him guilty of having taught the hateful doctrine that a priest who committed crimes could not give absolution for the crimes of others, and they held an auto de fe, which means a sentence of faith. As we read in Lee's History of the Inquisition, The Cathedral of Constance was crowded with Sigismund, the emperor, and his nobles, the great officers of the empire with their insignia, the prelates in their splendid robes. While mass was sung, Huss, as an excommunicate, was kept waiting at the door. When brought in he was placed on an elevated bench by a table, on which stood a coffer containing priestly vestments. After some preliminaries, including a sermon by the bishop of Lodi, in which he assured Sigismund that the events of that day would confer on him immortal glory, the articles of which Huss was convicted were recited. In vain he protested that he believed in transubstantiation and in the validity of the sacrament in polluted hands. He was ordered to hold his tongue, and on his persisting the beetles were told to silence him but in spite of this he continued to utter protests. The sentence was then read in the name of the council, condemning him both for his written errors and those which had been proven by witnesses. He was declared a pertinacious and incorrigible heretic, who did not desire to return to the church. His books were ordered to be burned, and himself to be degraded from the priesthood, and abandoned to the secular court. Seven bishops arrayed him in priestly garb, and warned him to recant while yet there was time. He turned to the crowd, and with broken voice declared that he could not confess the errors which he never entertained, lest he should lie to God, when the bishops interrupted him, crying that they had waited long enough, for he was obstinate in his heresy. He was degraded in the usual manner, stripped of his sacerdotal vestments, his fingers scraped. But when the tonsure was to be disposed of, an absurd quarrel arose among the bishops as to whether the head should be shaved with a razor, or the tonsure be destroyed with scissors. Scissors won the day, and a cross was cut in his hair. Then on his head was placed a conical paper cap, a cubit in height, adorned with painted devils and the inscription, This is the Heresiarch. The place of execution was a meadow near the river, to which he was conducted by two thousand armed men, with Paul's grave Louis at their head and a vast crowd, including many nobles, prelates, and cardinals. The route followed was circuitous, in order that he might be carried past the episcopal palace, in front of which his books were burning, whereat he smiled. 
Pity from man there was none to look for, but he sought comfort on high, repeating to himself, Christ Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. And when he came in sight of the stake, he fell on his knees and prayed. He was asked if he wished to confess, and said that he would gladly do so if there were space. A wide circle was formed, and Ulrich Shorand, who, according to custom, had been providently empowered to take advantage of final weakening, came forward, saying, Dear sir and master, if you will recant your unbelief and heresy, for which you must suffer, I will willingly hear your confession. But if you will not, you know right well that according to canon law, no one can administer the sacrament to a heretic. To this Huss answered, It is not necessary. I am not a mortal sinner. His paper crown fell off, and he smiled as his guards replaced it. He desired to take leave of his keepers, and when they were brought to him he thanked them for their kindness, saying that they had been to him rather brothers than jailers. Then he commenced to address the crowd in German, telling them that he suffered for errors which he did not hold, and he was cut short. When bound to the stake, two cartloads of faggots and straw were piled up around him, and the Paul's grave and folked, for the last time, adjured him to abjure. Even yet he could save himself, but only repeated that he had been convicted by false witnesses on errors never entertained by him. They clapped their hands and then withdrew, and the executioners applied the fire. Twice Huss was heard to exclaim, Christ Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me! Then a wind springing up and blowing the flames and smoke into his face checked further utterances, but his head was seen to shake and his lips to move while one might twice or thrice recite a paternoster. The tragedy was over. The sorely tried soul had escaped from its tormentors, and the bitterest enemies of the reformer could not refuse to him the praise that no philosopher of old had faced death with more composure than he had shown in his dreadful extremity. No faltering of the voice had betrayed an internal struggle. Paul's grave Louis, seeing Huss's mantle on the arm of one of the executioners, ordered it thrown into the flames, lest it should be reverenced as a relic, and promised the man to compensate him. With the same view the body was carefully reduced to ashes and thrown into the Rhine, and even the earth around the stake was dug up and carted off. Yet the Bohemians long hovered around the spot and carried home fragments of the neighboring clay, which they reverenced as relics of their martyr. The next day thanks were returned to God in a solemn procession, in which figured Sigismund and his queen, the princes and nobles, nineteen cardinals, two patriarchs, seventy-seven bishops, and all the clergy of the council. A few days later Sigismund, who had delayed his departure for Spain to see the matter concluded, left Constance, feeling that his work was done. Hellfire If such a scene could be witnessed in the world today, it would only be in some remote and wholly savage place, such as the mountains of Haiti or the Solomon Islands. It could no longer happen in any civilized country, the reason being, not any abatement of the pretensions of the priesthood, but solely the power of science embodied in the physical arm of a secular state. The advance of that arm the Church has fought systematically in every country and at every point. To quote Buckle, A careful study of the history of religious toleration will prove 
that in every Christian country where it has been adopted, it has been forced upon the clergy by the authority of the secular classes. The wolf of superstition has been driven into its lair, but it has backed away snarling, and it still crouches, watching for a chance to spring. The church which burned John Huss, which burned Giordano Bruno for teaching that the earth moves round the sun, that same church, in the name of the same three-headed god, sent out Francesco Ferrer to the firing squad. If it does not do the same thing to the author of this book, it will be solely because of the police. Not being allowed to burn me here, the clergy will vent their holy indignation by sentencing me to eternal burning in a future world which they have created, and which they run to suit themselves. It is a fact, the significance of which cannot be exaggerated, that the measure of the civilization which any nation has attained is the extent to which it has curtailed the power of institutionalized religion. Those peoples which are wholly under the sway of the priesthood, such as Tibetans and Koreans, Siamese and Caribbeans, are peoples among whom the intellectual life does not exist. Farther in advance are Hindus and Turks, who are religious but not exclusively. Still farther on the way are Spaniards and Irish. Here, for example, is a flashlight of the Irish peasantry, given by one of their number, Patrick McGill. The merchant was a great friend of the parish priest, who always told the people if they did not pay their debts they would burn forever and ever in hell. The fires of eternity will make you sorry for the debts that you did not pay, said the priest. What is eternity? he would ask in a solemn voice from the altar steps. If a man tried to count the sands on the seashore, and took a million years to count every single grain, how long would it take him to count them all? A long time, you'll say, but that time is nothing to eternity. Just think of it, burning in hell while a man, taking a million years to count a grain of sand, counts all the sand on the seashore. And this because you did not pay Farley McEwen his lawful debts, his lawful debts within the letter of the law. That concluding phrase, within the letter of the law, struck terror into all who listened, and no one, maybe not even the priest himself, knew what it meant. There is light in Ireland today, and hope for an Irish culture. The thing to be noted is that it comes from two movements, one for agricultural cooperation, and the other for political independence both of them definitely and specifically non-religious. This same thing has been true of the movements which have helped on happier nations, such as the republics of France and America, which have put an end to the power of the priestly caste to take property by force, and to dominate the mind of the child without its parents' consent. This is as far as any nation has so far gone. It has apparently not yet occurred to any legislature that the state may owe a duty to the child to protect its mind from being poisoned, even though it has the misfortune to be born of poisoned parents. It is still permitted that parents should terrify their little ones with images of a personal devil and a hell of eternal brimstone and sulphur. It is permitted to found schools for the teaching of devil doctrines. It is permitted to organize gigantic campaigns and systematically to infect whole cities full of men, women, and children with hellfire phobias. In the American city where I write, one may see gatherings of people sunk upon their knees 
even rolling on the ground in convulsions, moaning, sobbing, screaming to be delivered from such torments. I open my morning paper and read of the arrest of five men and seven women in Los Angeles, members of a sect known as the Church of the Living God, upon a charge of having disturbed the peace of their neighbors. The police officers testified that the accused claimed to be possessed of the divine spirit, and that as signs of this possession they crawled on the floor, grunted like pigs, and barked like dogs. There were other acts even more startling, about which the newspapers did not go into details. And again, a week or two later, I read how a woman has been heard screaming and found tied to a bedpost, being whipped by a man. She belonged to a religious sect which had found her guilty of witchcraft. Another woman was about to shoot her, but this woman's nerve failed and the high priest was called in, who decreed a whipping. The victim explained to the police that she would have deserved to be whipped had she really been a witch, but a mistake had been made. It was another woman who was the witch. And again, in the Los Angeles Times, I read a perfectly serious news item telling how a certain man awakened one morning and found on his pillow where his head had lain a perfect reproduction of the head of Christ with its crown of thorns. He called in his neighbors to witness the miracle, and declared that while he was not superstitious, he knew that such a thing could not have happened by chance, and he knew what it was intended to signify. He would buy more liberty bonds and be more ardent in his support of the war. And this is the world in which our scientists and men of culture think that the battle of the intellect is won, and that it is no longer necessary to spend our energies in fighting religion. End of Book One, Part Three End of Book One